overview of the program. Uh, the course is called the Online Entrepreneurship Program, and it is designed to help and facilitate participants to identify and pursue opportunities in the business as well as the non-business context, and especially in the post-COVID-19, that is the new normal. The course is based on the award-winning entrepreneurship model called the Entrepreneurial Plus model, and uh, the course is basically based on effectual. Uh, entrepreneurship and intellectual skills. Uh, we are offering advanced level and basic level. And overall, we have around uh, 350 participants registered from all over the world, especially from Pakistan. The crux is in Pakistan. So what you will be sharing the discussion, the session today, it will go live over states, over Europe, over UK, and it will reach across different towns and cities of Pakistan. Wonderful. For Dr. Nayar Naseem, uh, Dr. Nayar Naseem is a, just a second, let me go, let me put this on full screen. Yeah. Abdullah, can you see this? Yes, 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 yes. So just a second. Dr. Nayar Naseem has been very kind to accept our invitation and uh, deliver the session with us. Uh, Dr. Nayan Asim has a PhD in marketing from the Wayne State University, and he holds a BS in mechanical engineering and MS in industrial engineering. He has an experience of more than 14 years in sales, marketing, operations, warehousing, and quality management, both in India and the US in the top-notch companies. And his research expertise includes consumer behavior in international marketing, uh, strategy, and conceptual modeling using FEM. So we are very glad to have him, and we will be, uh, inshallah, benefiting from all the experiences that he has to share. Uh, Dr. Nayar Nassim is currently based in the Oklahoma City, and as he just explained, he's in the suburbs. He has traveled a distance of one day and one hour in a matter of few minutes. So we are very glad. And it's especially very good to see how the COVID uh, it has impacted the academia and it has brought faculty from across the world closer. So this is where he is from. Do you recognize this? I'm sure you've seen this on your passing, Dr. Nair. Yep. And mm. this is a view of a part of your city. I don't know if you live close by here or if you live far off or how often you pass through here. This is all. This is very close to the campus. You can actually see the the clock of the campus in somewhere in the background. Yes. Uh, yeah, I can see it. The green tower, the green, the green head. Yeah. 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 And this he is from the Northeastern State University, and this is an aerial view of the very beautiful campus, which I'm sure he enjoys and he's missing terribly right now. And this is also part of his university. And this is another shot of the campus. One thing which a lot of people in that part of the world wouldn't be knowing that this is also the headquarters of the Cherokee Nation. This is one of the major tribes of Native Americans who were, you know, thrown out of uh, the eastern coast of Northern Carol and Southern Carolinas. And there's a whole history of the Trail of Tears, uh, when President Andrew Jackson had their lands taken over by the white immigrants, and then they had to come and uh, settle here. So this was uh, this started as a seminary for uh, you know religious education for men and women, which uh, became a state university. So this is also Oklahoma as a state which is uh, famous for a sizable population of Native Americans and Cherokee Nation is one of the six or seven major tribes. So this is the headquarters of Cherokee Nation. So, so we read about the Native Americans, their dresses with all the turkey feathers and, and there's a very famous song by Michael Jackson, Black and White. So there is a sequence uh, with the with the Native Americans in that song, if you get a chance. It's, it's for the people of my generation, when I was in high school, uh, uh, you know, it came around, you know, 
rather I was in college in 1990s. Yeah. So it's a very, uh, it's a history associated with the institution. It was the first institution of higher learning west of the Mississippi River. So, so we, I'm just, uh, I'm fortunate to be here and uh, to be contributing to this. And, uh, and in any case, uh, let me first start with the, uh, thanking the, uh, uh, the director of entrepreneurship development program, Dr. Uh, Shahid Qureshi and the team uh, who gave me this opportunity and it's my privilege and pleasure to connect with the, with the audience. And I thank you for your time. And uh, I hope that you will find this discussion and talk meaningful. to add a brief uh, about my introduction that um, Pakistan holds a special uh, place in my heart because though I am not originally from Pakistan but my grandfather was an army officer who moved to Pakistan when my mother was about four years old and they settled in Rawalpindi Kant and they grew uh, she grew up there she went to presentation convent and then she eventually was married in India because my parents also happened to be cousins. And uh, so we, we grew up in India, but I've been to uh, Pakistan in 1979 last. Uh, that was a long time ago. <clears throat> so I've seen Karachi, Lahore, Pindi and Islamabad. Uh, uh, and uh, I have fond memories of that and uh, we had some good times. I have, I have all most of my maternals there. Some of them uh, moved out of Pakistan. So, and also the fact that I went to Aligarh Muslim University for my undergraduate studies. Um, so I also have a bond and I feel uh, responsibility and commitment towards uh, the people of Southeast Asia and particularly the Muslim community there uh, from which uh, to which I belong and come from. So it's my privilege to be part of this group and to be talking to you and to be sharing this learning uh, prior to moving to the United States in, in the year 2000, I got my undergraduate degree in engineering and MBA from India. I worked for uh, some top companies there. I got my master's and PhD here. I worked here too, and then I moved to academia. So it's been a wonderful journey of ups and downs in life. Uh, but I'm thankful to Almighty for uh, how far we have come in life. And I'm, I'm also thankful to all the people who have supported me, um, my friends and relatives and my teachers. And uh, and I think it's time for me to give back to the community. So that is one of the uh, the feelings with which I come back into your fold and uh, and share my learning to benefit uh, you know people in our community in our part of the world. So so with that, I want to get started uh, with my presentation and talk. Uh, so. Let me share the screen. Are you guys able to uh, see the slides? Yes, yes, we are. Okay, okay so I've, I've blown them up. So, so we start with in the name of God, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, and the topic uh, I'll be presenting. Uh, is about the core competencies uh, and comparative advantages for a successful business enterprise. So we'll try to understand what are these uh, terms mean and how we can uh, apply these to benefit a successful business enterprise. So there's a very famous saying by one of uh, the most inspirational poets we have ever had. And uh, Allama Iqbal, 
خود ہی کو کر بلند اتنا کہ ہر تقدیر سے پہلے خدا بندے سے خود پوچھے بتا تیری رضا کیا ہے So I don't feel that I need to translate this in English, but you see there's a lot of depth. It's not that you just find an eagle flying, you know, in the sky and he decides wherever he wants to sit. The depth is that you work so hard. For instance, a high school student works so hard that he gets certain grades and scores that he can choose any college he wants to, you know, Uh, join because everybody would be willing to take him so similarly if, if you as an individual or a business entity or an organization if you are committed and if you if you work hard then you know you have a choice to decide where and when to invest your time and effort and energy so that is the essence of this so all of us our dreamers and it's a good thing to dream but what we lag is uh, the hard work you know which should come with that dream to make, to realize those dreams so that is what i think we all as human beings all across the world you know sometimes we lag and those who who work hard and who are committed and who kind of uh, move towards goal, their goals and objectives in life on a daily basis they also Uh, you know achieve their goals and objectives so so there's a lot of depth to this and he's been a wonderful inspirational you know poet and i'm glad to see that you have this in your brochure so today we will talk about uh, <clears throat> primarily core competency and comparative advantage but before that i just want to talk a little bit uh, to set up a foundation and maybe locate ourselves in this domain of the business uh, world that uh, we start with what is entrepreneurship what is a managerial process and what is effectuation uh, method of entrepreneurship and then we'll come down to core competency comparative advantage so entrepreneurship is you know when you think about an entrepreneur so you you know we come across these different notions or terms like entrepreneur is somebody who is an owner of a business or you know who runs a business or who is a leader who is a manager or who has you know certain abilities who has money capital who is successful so all these you know things they come to your mind but in reality entrepreneurship is a person who is able to combine these resources in a way in a new way and then create value because of that combination so the process of discovering new ways of combining resources when the market value and the market value generated by this new combination of resources greater than the market value of the resources Uh, you know that can generate individually for instance if there is a bakery shop what do they do they get the flour because flour is available everywhere in the market but they convert it into their breads and cakes and pastries so they add value to it so it becomes an enterprise so similarly if let's say you have this uber or now we have these uh, you know deliveries a lot of restaurants who don't have who were not having this home deliveries so we can, there are a lot of companies which have come up online services where you can you order food and use their services to deliver food at home we have uber which has changed the game of the cabs around the world i don't know if uber is there in pakistan but in us it is so convenient that you can order it you know on your cell phone at any location you are wherever the services are available so anything innovative which is value added you know within the existing resources so if you can combine that so that person becomes an entrepreneur so then the other thing i uh, want to talk about is the managerial process so what is uh, 
what is a managerial process? So when we say that, so it's a, it's basically it refers to a series of steps which individuals, managers, organizations undertake to convert certain inputs, which are resources, into outputs by following these. You know, if you look at this, uh, the little schematic below the diagram, so you have the resources, uh, human, financial, raw materials, technological, and then you have these process, you know, planning, organizing, leading, implementing, controlling. So. So different authors use different terminology. Some use four, some use five or six steps. There could be more, there could be few, but this is what primarily it is. So you convert certain resources, inputs into outputs. So for example, let's take as an individual. So if you are graduating and you're looking for a job, you have to start planning about, you know, what kind of company you want to work with and uh, what kind of resources you have. If you want to start a business, you have to start with, you know, the first step is planning. If you, if you, have, if you are a wedding planner, somebody, let's say a brother or sister is getting married and you're given responsibility to plan their wedding. So, so you have to be a wedding planner. So you have to start with, you know, <clears throat> finalizing a lot of things. You have to finalize a date. You have to finalize the guest list. You have to finalize the menu, the location and everything. And then you have to organize and then implement lead and control. So this is, this cycle is called a managerial process. And as we kind of go through this, we also interact with the environment. And we also need to make some changes if any of these steps is not going as per our expectations. So there's a, always a feedback uh, which is coming back. You don't really have to start from planning if there's a there's a flaw in organizing or leading or implementing so so it depends upon where the issue is but but basically this is what the managerial process means <clears throat> and this is applicable across disciplines across fields across individuals organizations and business entities so this is what uh, you know the, this is the fundamental concept of management. Now, there's a professor, Sarah Saraswati, who uh, she is at, at Darden School of Business in Virginia. This is a ranked school. Uh, so she gave, came up with this approach, uh, it's called effectuation approach, which is being followed in this uh, program. And I kind of like this approach. Uh, so in this approach, they say that uh, uh, an approach to making decisions and performing actions in entrepreneurship processes where you, you identify the next back step by assessing the resources available in order to achieve the goals while continuously balancing these goals with your resources and actions. Now, you know, this is a English definition, but to make it easy, it basically means that you decide what you're going to do with the existing resources rather than deciding your goals and objectives first and trying to get the resources which are needed to achieve those goals and objectives. Sometimes they might not be accessible. Sometimes they might be expensive. So it's better for you or an individual who start with the resources at hand and then what and then decide what you can do with those resources what are the possibilities with what you have at hand and then you know you grow over a period of time when you you know develop your network of connections you get some more resources so it's like if somebody wants to start let's say a grocery store you don't have enough money to invest but you can think about, you know, if you want to start a modest, uh, you know, shop, you can start, if you happen to have your home at your street, you can just start it in the, in the, you know, in, in the front door of your home. And maybe as you grow, you can just rent a shop and maybe you can, you know, buy a building as you grow. So, so the essence of this approach is that 
think about resources you have at hand and from them you think about the possibilities rather than defining the objectives first and choosing the resources which can be difficult so so it's like things turn out best for the people who make best of the way how things turn out rather than waiting for a perfect time for the perfect resources to act you start acting uh, you know with what you have on hand so so if you look at these uh, uh, diagrams in the bottom so on the right we have the effectual thinking and on the left we have managerial thinking so you choose you decide your goals and then you also decide on your means but here you we've got certain means and then you imagine what the possibilities could be so this is the essence this is the difference and i love this approach <clears throat> some of the key terms which we use in this approach is uh, bird in hand you know it's better to start with the bird in hand rather you know trying to get the two in the bush because you never know that you know those two will fly off and you lose the one in hand too so you you start with what you resources you have laminate principle means that it could be you know you could see some um, challenges you might have some you know disappointments you might have some successes so mistakes and surprises are inevitable they're part of uh, you know if you start any business venture or any activity crazy quilt uh, you you don't know what kind of partnerships and people you will come across so it's like a a crazy quilt or you know a jaipur you know uh, it's called jaipuria rajai that it's it's got some patchwork and then of course you shouldn't only invest as much as you are willing to lose so affordable loss and it's like a pilot uh, driving a plane where he's the one who's navigating based on you know um, uh, based on where he's supposed to uh, land he maneuvers the plane to the destination so these four principles of entrepreneurship processes are used to plan and execute the next best, best step so similarly the pilot decides to navigate the plane the depending upon you know what are the weather conditions and how best he should uh, reach his destination. So these are some of the key terms of this uh, this concept. So one of the presidents of the US, 26 presidents, he said that in any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is do the right thing. The next best thing is maybe doing the wrong thing and the worst thing you can do is to do nothing because when you do anything you don't really know sometimes whether it's right thing or wrong thing so it might turn out to be the right thing or it might turn out to be a wrong thing but the worst thing you can do is to do nothing <laughs> this is another um diagram which i could find from the internet uh, uh, about this effectuation process so basically means that you know you need to do some kind of analysis uh, of what means do you have who you are what i know who I, and then you know what are the possibilities what can i do and who what kind of people and interactions and you know i can maybe possibly uh, synergize with uh, so they say that one and one doesn't make two it can make 11 so and then you start with the uh, deciding on uh, you know your possibilities of getting new means and deciding on new so this kind of cycle repeats so as you kind of start if you get started with the with the resources at hand and you start developing your network you might get access to new means and resources and you might uh, you know have some bigger goals so you start a small shop or a business even if it's a push cart for a food 
the other day i was jo- joking with one of my friends in dubai he was uh, a general manager in mod mcdonald a top company in power he lost his job because of covid so i said that if you got a million dollars then apply for the permanent residency in the united states and come here and we both will start a you know a a, a food business we will start a set up a push cart in new york city the new york city is very famous for these food carts they they dot the city all around and they are generally the the people who are new immigrants that is the thing which they do and they they could they make good living out of it and i have written a case study on that it got published last year so so the idea is that as you start you make some new connections you get access to some new means and resources and you can grow with uh, think beyond out of the box and 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 alhamdulillah people and i've been telling him that people the kids who can who, who can become hafiz at the age of 8 and 10 why can't they become the best surgeons in this world why can't they become the best doctors in the world, this world so this kind of uh, um, amazes me that you know the time and effort which is needed to you know learn a book which i am myself trying to do at this age but you know and i i find it amazing so i'm trying to motivate him to you know start a venture do something he had some ideas so i uh, encouraged him to join the course and alhamdulillah he's there so so just uh, get started the only delay is for you to get started to take that first step and things will fall in place and there's a lot of power in prayer because we all are believers and i am a strong believer too sometimes we get upset sometimes we get frustrated sometimes even we get mad with almighty but believe me i have had experiences and i am writing a book on these divine experiences so so there's a lot of power in prayer but your efforts have to be sincere your prayers have to be sincere and your committed your commitment has to be solid then only you know you will see how things can change so let's come to what is core competency so anything which you are doing or you are good at doing is core competency so a, a student might be good in math but maybe not as good as in english so math becomes his core competency so it's kind of a uh, a harmonized combination of multiple resources a skill that distinguishes a firm or even an individual in a marketplace in what they are good at doing now i am not saying that here at until this point that they are better than others because if you are better than others then your core competency becomes a competitive advantage so at this time you know we are just talking about the core competency that what you are good at doing so generally the competencies are skill based that they could be you know the knowledge based or technical knowledge or managerial skills or you know maybe you are following certain values and norms that you want to be a business which is customer centric and a business which is you know honest in its interaction so so all those are so it basically refers to what a person group or an organization or a firm is very good at doing what they think they they they're good at doing but here we are not comparing them with the others yet so it could be a tacit knowledge like if a restaurant has a good cook then nobody makes better masala chicken than him then you know it's their core competency or there is a business uh, you know uh, which has the best customer service or which has a best deliverable like you have internet service providers there are so many of them but one of them they might be charging you a little high but their service is better than most others so it could be their core competency or some anyone or any business which is you know good at doing anything 
that becomes their core competency. So, so but they are more like skill based uh, generally. Now, what happens is if you look at this uh, little uh, on the right side of this page, so let's say that there is a husband and wife, Barbie and Ken, right? So Barbie is, you know, generally uh, your the females, they are both good at cooking and they are good at cleaning. So they have, you know, relatively they have, I would say, an absolute advantage. So she can cook a meal in 10 minutes and uh, she can clean her room in 20 minutes, right? So cleaning, uh, cooking her meal and cleaning would take 30 minutes for her. And Ken, the husband, would cook in 40 minutes and clean in 30. So it would take him 70 minutes for, for him to do it. So what if they decide that Ken will clean both the rooms? So if Ken cleans both the rooms, he will do that in 60 minutes. And if Barbie cooks both the meals, she will do it in 20 minutes. So in total, they will, Barbie will save 10 minutes and he will save another 10 minutes. So their job would be done in a shorter period of time. So this concept is used in international marketing. So the company in the countries who are good at doing something, they should prefer doing that and then trade. But <clears throat> Comparative advantage as opposed to the core competency means that the ability of an entity or a group or an organization to carry out an economic activity such as making a product or providing a service more efficiently and better. So here, if your core competency is better than others, then you have a comparative advantage. So that is the little subtle difference between the two. A comparative advantage can come on the basis of your core competencies, which are primarily your skills, or that can be on the basis of access to a resource. So Saudi Arabia has abundant oil resources or Qatar has abundant gas resources. So, so they have a comparative advantage in terms of lower energy costs. Now, United States is very good you know, in technology and computer programming and software development. So they have a comparative advantage in, you know, or maybe high advanced weapon systems uh, in, in, the, in those areas. And similarly, China has cheap labor. So they have a comparative advantage in, uh, you know, uh, in the operations and production costs. So, so when we talk about uh, uh, comparative advantage, uh, we need to also talk about uh, these resources uh, which can give you the comparative advantage. And these are called, uh, sometimes called Vryn or Vryo resources, the resources which are valuable, which are rare, which are inimitable and which are non-substitutable. So they can give you a, a, a competitive advantage. For instance, um, if you talk about this, uh, let's say the some kind of a marble, which only comes from a certain query, so nobody else has access to that query. So let's let's say if it's a Makrana marble or Italian marble, or there's some kind of a granite which is coming from Brazil or India. So there's only one part of the world or a query where it is coming. So so you can literally dictate the price. So you have a comparative advantage because you have access to that particular source. And it is rare and nobody can, in, 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 like nobody can create that natural, uh, you know, stone anywhere else because that is where it happens to be. So, um, so these resources have to be, you know, valuable, inimitable and non-substitutable to, to give you a comparative advantage. And uh, so in any case, so this, uh, this was a theory which was given by Barney, uh, a scholar in 1991, and it's called resource-based view. I'm sure Dr. Qureshi is familiar with this. 
um, but the but you see the essence is that a lot of companies might have these resources there might be a lot of nations who have access to uh, to the uh, to what do you say the oil and gas and but then how do they one is better than other so it's like uh, <clears throat> there are two students let me give you an example there are two students who primarily come from the same background they go to the same school they have access to the same teachers they have access to the same resources but one is topping the class and the other one is barely able to pass so it's like you know pappu ki maa kehti hai ki papp hamara pappu intelligent to bahut hai lekin padhta nahi hai lekin pappu jo hai you know if he has pappu has all the resources but if he if the pappu doesn't work hard he will not be able to succeed in the class so having these resources is not enough you need to have the dynamic capability to convert those resources and you know get a comparative advantage by benefiting out so so this so this concept of uh, comparative advantage is extended a step further by um, uh, with the companies who are able to convert those resources into into required output so that kind of dynamic capabilities will also lead to comparative advantage if you can convert resources to the desired outputs and then the last part is the values uh so values are things you believe are important uh, you know in a culture and the way you live and work so they can be related to service integrity commitment you know teamwork and a lot of companies they have certain values and they determine your priorities what are your priorities are you there only to make money fly by wire or are you there to you know make a difference in the community by your business enterprise so if you are going uh, you know let's say on a freeway if you if you take a uh, you know, let's say a bus from uh, from lahore to let's say rawalpindi so there might be some bus stops so i've seen this in india at least when we go from new delhi to rurki where we grew up so there used to be midway there used to be some bus stops so these restaurants had a tendency of ripping the customers but there was one guy who decided not to rip the customers and give them a best and reasonable service and they have grown several folds because of their honesty and integrity so that is uh, these values kind of also are kind of act like a guiding principle so when we talk about uh, resources and processes and values together so you have the resources which give you comparative advantage then you have processes which are more like your dynamic capabilities and then you have these values so they together can lead to a competitive advantage so this is kind of uh, being used by the southwest airlines here in the united states <clears throat> so so this is kind of a continuum of having resources uh, the processes which are dynamic capability and the value systems uh, which you follow in order to you know be successful as an individual or an, a business entity or a now prior to starting every company needs to assess or an individual needs to assess their strengths and weaknesses so this is a very popular uh, tool which we use in business management so you assess your strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats so what are your strengths you need to build on those strengths what are your weaknesses you want to focus on that if you can Uh, if let's say you lack knowledge probably that's why we are here in this course to get some business knowledge uh, if you lack any uh, kind of uh, financial resources or human resources so we can focus on that. what are the opportunities uh, in the sense that what are the markets or the needs which are unfulfilled uh, let's say there is no grocery store in the neighborhood uh, for 
let's say half a kilometer. So maybe if you open a grocery store there, there's a chance that you would be successful. So that's an opportunity for you. But the threat could be that if there's another grocery store in the neighborhood, you would have competition from them or threat could be the regulation. So we need to access that, but strengths and weaknesses are more like internal situation analysis and opportunities and threats. They are more like focused on the external, uh, like more on the business environment. So, <clears throat> so it's important to understand your, you know, your strengths and weaknesses, honestly. And here, you know, this is a little cartoon about in a company, they're trying to assess their weaknesses and they don't want to point and look at each other because they really know that what are their strengths and weaknesses. But, but the gentleman, supposedly the CEO is saying that don't look at me, you know, when you, you talk about our weaknesses and uh, the opportunities and threats, you know, it depends upon uh, when I talk about the business environment, you know, let's take it. India and Pakistan are highly corrupt societies. You know, we have a highly corrupt social culture and business environment. Things don't move without bribing, you know, the people, the government officials. So you, a business should know that. So if you want to be successful by saying that, you know, you know, I, I, I don't want to be dishonest, then maybe, you know, you might not be successful. So they say the violent Rome do as the Romans do. And the business school would say that honesty may not be the best policy, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, honesty may be the best policy, but it's not often the best business plan. So, so what do we do? So this is a dilemma for a lot of businesses in countries like India and Pakistan or even Nigeria, you know, which are pretty high on corruption. United States is, by the way, 23rd. And the, the country which is on the top least corrupt is New Zealand. And Scandinavia, you know, Finland, Sweden, are, you know, Netherlands. So those are the countries which are, but we do have, uh, and I think Pakistan ranks, you know, 150th or something. So, so it's pretty below, pretty low. But but that does that mean that we should uh, be become we also should become a dishonest business so that's the big question right so there is a hadith uh, i've given the reference on the top so allah's apostle, apostle prophet muhammad peace be uh, upon him he said that one, if one gives charity what equals to even a date of fruit date fruit like Khajur from an honestly earned money, it will become like a mountain, right? It becomes like a mountain. So now the question is that the emphasis here is on honestly earned money. The, the question is that should we follow the, the saying of St. Augustine or should we follow the pro, you know, obviously everybody will say that, you know, we are Muslims, so we should follow the same thing of Prophet Muhammad, but how many of us ideally do? That includes me too. And will it be, you know, relatable to the business, private business, right? Now I'll give you some statistics, which is going to amaze you. The 10 most valuable brands of 2020, Amazon, $220 billion, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Samsung, these businesses are based on the value system which they follow and the ethics which they follow, which are based on integrity, customer cent centricity and honesty. So we are not talking about the fly by wire businesses here. So these even Walmart, Walmart is in my, in my neighborhood because where I am, uh, there's a place called uh, Fateville. That's where Sam Walton started that. So you have Walmart and Sam's Club here uh, with his name. It, it used to be number one company until five, six years ago, but now Amazon is growing leaps and bounds. So at the moment, the best customer service you can find 
is with Amazon. Lastly, I just want to touch base on uh, one thing which I'm very fond of telling my students about what is happiness, what makes you happy. So there was a study done in Harvard. They, they had a survey done and a lot of people came up with these ideas of happiness, what makes them happy, money makes them happy, food makes them happy, but with no order, certain order, uh, there are three things which came on the top. The first one was, and these are not in any order, but the first one is whether you enjoy what you do. Whether you love your job, you love your daily routine, or you are forced to get up and go and do your thing. So if you are forcing yourself, then at least have a plan to get out of it and start doing what you love. So if you are lucky to find a job or a vocation which you enjoy, that makes you happy. The second thing is good relationships. So how are your relationships with your siblings, with your parents, with your friends, with your community? So as long as you have good relationships, it's going to make you happy because at least I cannot work for the entire day. If I had an argument with my wife in the morning or I would yelled at my kids last evening, I just cannot work. Well, it makes me so stressful. I feel guilty for my actions for whatever reasons. But if that can happen in the spur of a time, if that extends, if you don't have a good relationships, then it's going to impact your happiness. And of course, the third thing and the most important thing is in whatever ways and means, if you help others, that makes you happy. And you have, you've got a saint there. He should have got, he should have won Nobel Prize several times over, several times over. But you know what? He never got it because he comes from a certain community. Because maybe, you know, you know, the, the people who decide on this Nobel Prize didn't find that he deserved the Nobel Peace Prize for what he did. And Obama, who got this Nobel Peace Prize just by getting elected, he himself said, uh, you know, I was surprised to get a Nobel Peace Prize because that was only hope after we had seen a presidency which uh, had, which was involved or maybe, you know, because of the wars in Iraq and everything. So people were fed up because of that. And, and he got a Nobel Prize, Obama, just because of, for the hope. But this gentleman, who is a saint, who was a living saint, he never got it because, you know, probably whatever, you know, reasons uh, you can decide on, but he came from the government. But we did get Malala Yousafzai got a Nobel Prize from Pakistan. Um, <clears throat> some of the many Pakistani people I admire. Uh, Imran Khan, he happens to be a current prime minister and there might be people who might uh, disagree or like him or dislike him now, but at least he was, everybody liked him when he won the World Cup for the, con for the country. At least he has been brought accolades to the country. Jahangir Khan, I don't know how many of you know this gentleman because, you know, he was a, probably came from my generation. He was an unbeatable world champion of squash. And his nephew also, Janshir Khan, Khan also, you know, became a champion eventually. Muin Akhtar, one of our favorites, uh, stand-up comedians. We used to listen to his cassettes and eventually the video shows. Then, of course, Malala Yousafzai. She is doing a wonderful job, uh, uh, you know, for the uh, liberty, emancipation of women. And of course, you have a saint there, um, Yidi Sahab. And then Zahra Abbas, she got an MBA. I'm not sure, maybe Dr. Qureshi can help me. I don't know if she got it from Lums or IBA, but uh, mm -hmm. she mm -hmm. is an epitome of success that disability mm -hmm. cannot, you know, uh, for any person as disabled as she, her, and she is so successful. And I've listened to her talk, so I admire, really admire her. 
So with that, I just uh, want to end this with the last quote, uh, which uh, you know I often uh, say to my classes that each one of us, by the grace of Almighty, is capable of achieving things more than what we can even dream of. Really, each one of us, by the grace of Almighty, is capable of achieving things more than what you can even dream of. But the only condition is, and you know, students become happy when I say this, that you can achieve things more than what you can dream of. I give them a couple of minutes to become happy, but you know, there's a condition. There's a condition, there's a difference. And that difference is here, the mindset. So you need to have the right mindset, the positive attitude, strong commitment, and a will to work hard. So there's no literal difference between, you know, at least I believe that very strongly and with a strong commitment. There is no difference in the way you have been blessed as a human being, listening to this talk, sitting in your homes, wherever you are located, and a, and a student who might have registered at Harvard or UC Berkeley these are the or MIT, these are the top schools of US. I don't see any difference. But there is a difference in what you have been blessed for. But the difference comes in how much they have worked hard in their mindset, in their commitment. So if there is a will, there is always a way. So I wish you luck in whatever you do in life. Give it your 110% or 200% and you will see that success will come to you. You don't have to chase success. It will come to you. With that, I thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, I would appreciate and eager to answer that. Mm, great. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim once again. Uh, my dear Nayar Saab, thanks a lot. I was a bit late and I couldn't uh, welcome you. My team member Taskeen and Abdullah were there to welcome you, sir. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it's great to uh, look at the words of wisdom and love and emanating from past bomb, milge, kawe, kosanam khane se. And we're getting some great words of wisdom from West, from our very own people. And I have a lot of regards for Nayir Saab. Hamari Ahmed Zahir Saab is here. Yes, can you? I think, or maybe I can do that. So, I've done that. There's a special, I will be mixing Dr. Jamil Sahib, Dr. Nair 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 Sahib, Dr. Jisne Pakistan ki baniyado mein apna khun dala tha jin ke ilm o hikmat aur jin ki taaleem aur us baniyad jo hamare mohtaram sir sayyid ahmed khan aur us zamane ke thode si urdu bolne mein dil kar raha hai us zamane ki nahi bilkul nahi jo us zamane ke akabar e millat aur hamare ji ilm ne jiski baniyad rakhi thi ye us shehar se us koche se inka taluq हमारे बड़ी सादत की बात है इनके पेरेंट्स बालदा राहुल मंडी से ताल्लुक है और तो ये हमारे से लेकिन माय फादर एक्चुअली और ही वाज आल्सो ए ग्रेजुएट ऑफ अलीगढ़ उन्होंने भी अपनी इंजीनियरिंग वहीं से किया था एंड माय एल्डर ब्रदर इज अ कंसलटेंट सर्जन इन डब्लिन आयरलैंड ही आल्सो गॉट हिज मास्टर्स एमएस इन जनरल सर्जरी एंड देन ही वेंट फॉर हिज फेलोशिप तो माशाल्लाह से सारे लोग अलीगढ़ के पढ़े हुए हैं हमारी फैमिली में मोस्ट ऑफ देम uh, and I'm, I'm very thankful. You see, Aligarh might not be a perfect institution or the best institution, but, but at least the way it develops your personality uh, and the way, uh, you know, at least for the Muslim community in particular, Aligarh ka jo contribution hai hamari zindagi mein, wo hum kabhi bhi usko, we cannot downplay it. We will always underscore whatever we are as a family, is because of the opportunity we got there. And thank, 
you know, uh, uh, thankfully, just Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. In fact, I was talking to Muhammad Ali, my Quran teacher, this morning, that you know, had we were not lucky to have Ali Gar Muslim University, then the Indian Muslim community would have been in shambles because whatever exactly. we have now is because of that. And uh, you know, later on, some other institutions came up. But it's because of Aligarh Muslim University. So, Alhamdulillah. Uh, I just uh, want to add a few points. Uh, Ahmed Zahir Sahib, because my senior hand, Dr. Jamil Sahib, mashallah. So I keep on referring to them. Nazali Abid Sahib, abhi. So young people, mind not kya karein. Adran Sahib, Aap bhi mere liye itne important hain. Wo bazarko ko dekh kar na, hamare dil ki mohabbat jaag uthti. Aur main main sarshar ho jata hoon. Itne kimti vakt se nikala hua hai. So my really. और इस फिल्म को मेरे पास नहीं भाई ये किताब है मेरे पास इस वक्त जिसका नाम है हर्फ़ शौक और मैं इसमें से चंद लाइनें पढ़ना चाहता हूँ आपको ट्रिब्यूट पेश करने और ये और अल्लाह ताला ये असल में मुख्तार मसूद साहब अलीगढ़ यूनिवर्सिटी के ग्रेजुएट थे ये माइग्रेटेड टू पाकिस्तान फिर ये सिविल सर्वेंट में राइज किया बहुत शानदार अदीब है तो उसमें लिखते हैं कि उन्नीस सौ बीस नाइनटीन ट्वेंटी के एक दिन का जिक्र है 1920 में अलीगढ़ यूनिवर्सिटी को असनाद जारी करने का अख्तियार मिल गया और यूनिवर्सिटी का पहला जलसाए तकसीम असनाद हुआ और उस उस तकसीम असनाद की सदारत एक खातून कर रही थी एक खातून चीफ गेस्ट थी जिनका नाम था हर हाइन सुल्तान जहां बेगम बालिया भोपाल वो वो एक कुर्सी पर तशरी फरमा थी चेहरे पर नकाब किया हुआ था चेहरे पर नकाब था खुतबे का हर लफ्स हर शख्स को साफ सुनाई दे रहा था एक घंटे तक उनने तकरीर की और उसने कुछ तजावीज दी उन तजावीज में से चंद पढ़ के देख लो सर आप सर धुनेंगे कि हमारी खातन उन्नीस सौ बीस में ये विजन था नाजली साहबा ये विजन था उनका वो क्या कहती है वो कहती हैं कि जनाब इस मुस्लिम यूनिवर्सिटी की इज्जत की हिफाजत के लिए इसका मैार तालीम हमेशा बुलंद रखना यहाँ का ग्रेजुएट बाय से इम्तियाज हो इसी किस्म की मसलहत को यहाँ कभी ना आने देना और हमारी नज़रें यहाँ के तलबा पर लगी रहेंगी कि वो मजहब घर कौम जात और हुकूमत की खातर अपने फ़राइज को किस खुश सलूबी से अदा कर और वो ये कहती हैं कि इनका नस्बुल अरे अलीगढ़ वालों तुम्हारा नस्बुल जो होना चाहिए कि फलसफा हमारे दाएं हाथ में और साइंस बाएं हाथ में मोहम्मद का ताज हमारे सर पर सर लुक एट दिस वर्ड कमिंग वेटिंग फ्रॉम साइंस और सनत की तालीम हमारे लिए हकीकी और हतमी तेज तौर पर नतीजा खेज होनी चाहिए इस दानिश गाह का ये जुमरा सुने इस दानिश गाह का हासिल ऐसे तलबा हों जो अपनी जिंदगी इल्म के लिए वक्त कर दें ताकि मुलाजमत के लिए इल्म के लिए वक्त बने ताकि मुलाजमत के लिए हजरात ईंट और गारे और चूने और पत्थर की ये शानदार इमारतें देखने में तो अच्छी लगती हैं लेकिन इनकी हल्की की शान उस वक्त नुमाया होती है जब इनके अंदर किए हुए कामों के शानदार नतज हों दुनिया की कोई इमारत इस मामले में उस कच्ची दीवार और नीचे छत वाले खुजरा नबी सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम से ज्यादा शानदार नहीं है हजरत यूनिवर्सिटी शानदार इवानों और बड़ी बुलंद इमारतों और बोर्डिंग हाउसेस का नाम नहीं ना यूनिवर्सिटी हर साल हजारों तलबा को डिग्री देने का देने का कारखाना कह सकते हैं ये उस ये, ये सौ साल पहले गहरे से नाइनटीन ट्वेंटी में डिग्री देने का कारखाना नहीं इसको मतलब होना चाहिए इस इलम का नूर दुनिया में फैले और जहालत की जुल्म और तो तारीखी दूर हो तो सर अल्लाह से दुआ करते हैं कि सर अहमद जहिर भाई जमील साहब डॉक्टर साहब और के हमारी हमारी ये सर नाइनटीन ट्वेंटीज में ना सर नैर भाई अमेरिकन यूनिवर्सिटी के बारे में ये लिखा होता था तो ये क्रिश्चन यूनिवर्सिटीज के बारे में ये लिखा होता था अल्लाह से दुआ करते हैं कि सर हमारी कोशिश अल्लाह तबूल फरम